questions in the last lecture, how do you organize quality control? Which in, which in all such systems is a very important part. All parts. If you have data, you have to have, we were discussing standards. Someone has to control what, what I mean, I know that it's not an easy job. Yeah. In all databases, you have the problem. What should be in it, and what can, because it's somehow they, they, taken as a reference. And the data, the quality control is very important. How do you organize? That's true. And quality control is part and model. So quality control part and model depend on how they are generated. So we allocate our data based on and the um, based on some levels, so we call them gold, silver, bronze, for example. If the part is characterized through experiments, and we have high confidence, we allocate those parts or models accordingly. And sometimes we use predictions or computational tools, like quantifying parts. So we use some prediction tools, and in that case, we say this part is characterized or predicted by using a computational tool, and and that annotation is also searchable. If your tool is using the resources that I showed, you can filter them. You can use the high quality ones if you want to. So that's the quality control we have at the moment. But uh, what I can also say, the in silico part is going really fast, so we can write a program, we can integrate data. But the feedback from the experiment at the moment is the bottleneck. So the characterization of parts is taking more time. I, I mean, by asking this question, we also have the problem in general with mathematical software, for instance. Mm -hmm. There is now a huge collection in Oberwolf. How do you, I mean, we have, re, uh, we have reviewing system for theory and for mm -hmm. papers, but the problem is what, how do you do it with software, for mm -hmm. instance, which you need if you, if you do uh, uh, provide uh, algorithms. For it. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there are of course several approaches maybe, but I, we tend to, when developing a software, we always tend to write some unit tests that would handle the particular problem and make sure at least they are covered. Of course, there will be things that we didn't cover, and it's, I think, it's a continuous process to improve the whole thing here. I guess if, if I may uh, rebound on the question. For example, in the beginning when you mentioned ontologies and you said that you're doing faceted uh, queries and, and, and aggregation of queries, thanks to Sparkle and other yeah. ontologies, of course you're managing content from the database and you're query, querying with ontologies. But ontologies could be seen as content as well when they evolve. So how do you manage the fact that your ontologies can evolve as well? So the same query could provide different answers from ontology version 1 to ontology version 2 on the same databases, which is basically the life cycle management of the ontology. Um, well, I guess it, if the ontology is evolving, I assume your knowledge base, your data is also evolving. Otherwise, you wouldn't just introduce a term just for the sake of introducing. I assume you've also done some data integration. And sometimes the, the owners of the ontology are doing the evolution by themselves on their side, and the database don't necessarily reflect mm -hmm. the impact. Yeah, well, um, in that case, I guess the query is going to turn anything, basically. Yes, yeah, that's my point. <laughs> uh, yeah, but maybe we can improve this process by uh, making these terms available to computation tools, and you only choose terms available exactly. as it is. Exactly. Actually, this, this is we have been doing an equivalent system for the uh, industrial uh, side, and wherever we release the, the, the query language, we check that Basically, there is some sort of mathematical equivalences for some uh, query primitives from version 1 to version 2 to version 3, so that at least we retrieve the same kind of answers. And if we have like dramatic disruptions, then we need to, to rethink the system or at least revise the content. It needs math bar. Yeah. yeah. Like, yes, like a very quick comment on this, I think. So I'm also involved in the ESCO development a little bit. Those are the kind of problems that we would like to have actually right now on the synthetic biology side. Yes. Because the more basic problem is that most of the data obviously is not not in the ASCO stack, Agreed. it's not, not actually there. So so it's very good problems, but I, I would love to have those problems <laughs> reading a paper where I don't even get the sequence. Yeah, I understand that. Yes, sir. Thanks.
Um, I, I was not mean not to let you uh, <laughs> for the entire session. I do not consider it as a sanction <laughs> against my country. Uh, so, uh, upon down to the first two questions. Uh, is your query system and database stable against the errors and full questions? If I put on a query with a minor uh, mistake, so what level of errors would yield a senseless answer and which one still brings something reasonable and uh, uh, useful to work with. Okay, the queries, well, there are lots of query types. The one that I showed here using ontologies and that would force you to create an ontology term. Using this approach you can't you can't make mistakes because you have to use an existing ontology tool, mm -hmm. such as Protege. I can. Um, what can some of the mistakes? I can. <laughs> <laughs> By using this approach, the end user would have to. So, maybe the next thing is to provide a computation mm -hmm. database abstracting views of ontologies. Excuse me, did you test your system physically? <laughs> yes. Why not? I did, yes, of course. Okay. <laughs> Great. Is it possible to see some report on testing? No? Uh, yes, so I was showing a table of summaries with classifications, so that was my examples. But then I presented some additional competence questions about pathways, how to upregulate a compound, how to target a specific pathway or how to target a specific coding sequence, upregulate the compound, for example. Um, and you can easily write queries. But I guess you have to be an expert on no, ontology, because you are not, I know, but. Our task is then to provide some computational tools which would abstract that ontology level mm -hmm. and you just choose some drop-down boxes basically I, I think that's the next thing. And if possible, the, the question to the previous, the first one presented, if it's possible. Um, I'm sorry? Is it? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, when you said about the microbiome, uh, what kind of diversity or natural dispersion of that letter uh, is behind your presentation. I mean, dietary actually affects survival of the biome and uh, some other uh, uh, aspects as well. So, what is the natural diversity of the biomes you have uh, studied and uh, what is the standard deviation of your data or something like that? So, uh, this is a very good question and an extremely complicated one. Uh, the standard deviation of our data is extremely small for the simple reason that what we're doing right now is mice. They are fed with the same batch of the exact same food over and over again. They came from the same facility. So from mouse to mouse there is a very minimal deviation in uh, the type of microbiome they have. But this is not quite artificial, but this is also not quite natural. Uh, in one of my introductory slides, there was something about the abundance of Bacteriolis theta iota micron. They need to change that name. Um, <laughs> and uh, in uh, sampled microbiomes, about 46% of humans are going to have theta, and conversely, 54% are not going to have it. It doesn't mean they're not going to have Bacteriolis, they're just going to have another one. Um, so, to an extent, everything we propose right now are proof of concepts. Uh, and what we envision in the longer term is some form of personalized medicine, where maybe this exact strain would not be the way to go. But we're trying to develop sets of tools that can be applied generally to microbes that can be used within uh, natural microbiomes. Same as the phage, I presented a single scaffold, but I'm not expecting that any real-life application would exclusively use T7-like phages. We would need a couple different scaffolds for the simple reason that uh, some diseases are caused by gram-negative, some by gram-positive, and to my knowledge, there is not a single phage which is capable of targeting both. Uh, so, at the very least, we need a minimum of two scaffolds. The same is true for all of those bacterial engineering systems that we envision in Bacteriolis. We do it in Bacteriolis theta iota micron because it is somewhat characterized 
And to start a project, you need something which is not completely unknown. Uh, but we are moving into experiments where we actually isolate bacteria from natural microbiomes and see to what extent we can transplant everything we've built so far into those bugs that we know nothing if the 16S sequence. Excuse me, very simple question. For two human beings with drastically different immune status, very strong and very weak, what kind of difference do you expect in biome? Uh, well, in brief, in, in the most general terms. I don't know how to answer that <laughs> quantitatively. Qualitatively, very different. So, uh, someone who has Crohn's disease will see its uh, complement of, um, of enterobacteria, say, a bug from about 0.1% to something in the range of 5%, an example. Uh, so, it can be pretty drastic. That's the whole whole idea behind trying, behind the implication of microbiome in disease. Uh, this biosis is the whole idea, and we're trying to find ways to, to adapt microbiome to a more healthy situation. Um, and yes, it will need to be tested, obviously, but we are not there yet at all. Mm. So, um, do you know what is the stoichiometry for the repression with the Cas9? I mean, do you need a lot of RNA and a little of Cas9, or a lot of both things, or I mean, how? Because you know, you have a repression, but by default, you have a fixed amount of Cas9 and a fixed amount of RNA, right? So, do you know whether you can modify the effect by playing with the relative amounts that you have of uh, Cas9 and, and RNA? Uh, yes, it's possible. Uh, the way it is implemented in those theta experiments is that Cas9, DCAS9 itself, is under IPTG induction. And uh, based on IPTG uh, concentration, we see uh, a, a sigmoidal uh, response like you would expect from uh, any other IPTG yeah, system. Yeah, but you know how many molecules are involved in, 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 in the process. I mean, you have like 1 to 10 or 100, 1,000 to 1. Because the target is just one promoter, right? So how much of the other components you need to have a repression? So Cas9 works at very low concentration. I would not be capable of telling you how many molecules of DCAS9 you have in the cell, uh, but it is not the limiting factor. Usually the limiting factor is the guide RNA, because it's a small RNA and it's pretty unstable. So the problem is that it varies a lot from guide RNA to guide RNA. Uh, it was also visible in the data that I showed. I kind of skipped through it, but you could see uh, very drastic differences in efficiency from a guide RNA to a guide RNA, and some of them differ by only a few base pairs. You know, it's you take one and you take one which is a few base pairs downstream, and there can be as much as a twofold difference, uh, even three. So it can vary drastically, but it's difficult to deconvolute what is. Uh, actual efficiency of binding of the multiple components from stability of the respective components. Some sort of a founding question about microbiome engineering. Sorry for that, but really it comes up. Um, it, it is pretty clear to, in, in my opinion at least, perhaps am I wrong, that uh, the microbiome is a, is a world of itself that not only has interactions with the host organism but also has lots of interactions among the different bacteria uh, or microorganisms that, uh, that live in the intestine boxes. Uh, from that point of view, uh, if for instance we would like to set up a microorganism that um, produces some uh, more of a, a vitamin for the benefit of the host, it is pretty clear that it will change the composition of the microbiome because it will have some bacteria which will be favored by the existence of this vitamin that they cannot make, for instance, and will benefit from it. And in the end, it is not even sure that the host organism actually will benefit from this probiotic uh, uh, bacter uh, engineered bacteria. So that uh, my question then would be. Um, what is the value? What is the value of working on one of these components, let's say theta? Sorry, I 
Theta is the name for me. Theta, go to... <laughs> to, uh, um, to obtain any type of result of, of uh, a net output uh, in, a, in a real situation. Uh, without taking into account the whole uh, the, the, the interactions with the other microorganisms, either through modeling or directly uh, empirically. Uh, so theta yota micron. Repeat after. <laughs> I was too thorough. Now to get to the actual question. Uh, so the question is, what is the importance? And this is an excellent question. Uh, what is the importance of the, the interrelations between the various members of the microbiome when you're trying to engineer it? And the answer is uncharted. Uh, the only thing we know is that there are interactions. But I don't know of any paper which managed to link in any way two species together. We know they interact. That's all we know. So at this point, it's completely exploratory. Maybe we won't be able to do anything useful, and maybe we will. And that's the whole idea. Maybe we will. Uh, just one more thing. What we are targeting now uh, are more uh, really disease, diseased microbiomes. So we're not really trying to go into the metabolomics of the microbiome and just uh, delicately engineer out a given uh, uh, pathway while increasing the level of expression of another one. We are more thinking of things like there is a bad bacterium, we want it out. Um, and this should be feasible. I mean, we can do it to some extent in the lab. Uh, it's a question of efficiency after that. I have a practical question. So you are working with a strictly anaerobic bacterium. Bacteroides is strictly anaerobic. But you are using as your porter luciferase. How do you combine this? Because luciferase obviously requires oxygen. Nanoluc, and that's the whole difference. Nanoluc was designed, uh, I don't remember if it's thermal or stratagene, uh, to be active under anaerobic conditions. So it's all in the reporter. And I have no idea what they did. But Nanoluc is perfectly functional under anaerobic conditions. Yes, believe, without oxygen. Well, depending on the assays, there may or may not be oxygen, and here I would need Mark, who actually did the measurements, to have a clear answer. So, we have made measurements where we take the stool and we do it in a test tube, and here there's plenty of oxygen. But he's also made in situ luciferase measurements, and those I am not sure how he performed. But what I am sure of is that Nanoluc works, even under anaerobic conditions. They first tried with various members of the fluorescent pr proteins. None of them ever worked because of that anaerobic condition problem. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would like to add is that although uh, bacteroidus is strictly anaerobic, it is uh, oxygen tolerant. So you can actually grow it anaerobically, take it to your desk, and it will not die. It will stop growing, but it will not die. So there are a lot of things that you can still measure aerobically, although you have grown everything anaerobically. Okay. I'm just curious, you, may, you have a microbiome and you have these bacteriophages. Are they also in your gut? Yeah. Uh, they should be. Yeah. So, yeah, they are. <laughs> Already, probably ten times more phages in your guts than bacteria, and there are already probably a hundred times more bacteria than human cells in so your guts. Could there be an option to to somehow coordinate or modify the activity of the bacteriophages to have a positive effect? Yes. <laughs> so um, that's maybe I went too fast on that. Indeed, that's one of the ideas why we're trying to control uh, host range. Everything with bacteriophages in the end boils down to host range. Uh, and this is an extremely complex phenotype to control. But yes, one of the ideas we want is to be able to use the phages to clear up space for whatever engineered bacterium we construct to set, settle in, uh, because direct competition between an engineered microbe and a natural microbe is unlikely to ever lead to colonization. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may indeed resort to 
uh, directly isolating phages from the gut uh, and engineering them the way we want them and so on. Or that may have to do with phages that we already have in the lab and we just engineer to have a different host range. And at this point, we're just trying out and we don't know yet what works. There's one question. Do you think that uh, it can be some, uh, that the nutrient that you, the diet, can induce metabolic switch in the microbiome? Gut feeling says yes. <laughs> uh, gut feeling. <laughs> uh, but I can't think of a paper I read which actually measured that. I can think of papers that measured uh, the various, so that started from a, a, a homogeneous population of mice, for that instance, and then they submitted them to various diets and found out that at the end they had a completely different microbiome, but I don't think that was ever correlated to some form of metabolomic. Now the field is moving quickly, so it's not impossible, it was yeah, yeah. just didn't read the paper, but yes, it's That's kind of obvious. It's the sense of the history. It's kind of obvious, yes. So, yes, there will be some change. What change? Who knows? I have a hesitant question. So, yeah. is it possible to represent the effect of uh, the recombinase or something that modifies the design itself? Or a like Cas9, but that would cut the design and therefore maybe answer something new? Using yes for you, mean? Mm -hmm. So the question is, you have a Cas9 catalytic active, and you represent, you want to represent that using S. Was that the question? Um, I would like to represent that it can modify the original design. The design can modify itself. Yes, you can represent it, yes. And you can basically uh, create components for, the, for your target as well. <coughs> and then you can add annotations. And you can also create an interaction using SPOL entities. So there's an interaction mm -hmm. entity between SPOL. You can say that interaction basically represents the genome editing. And it has two participants. One is the complex, and the second one is the <coughs> DNA. And you can also assign roles to the participants using the SPOL interactions. I think that would be sufficient for you to exchange data. Yeah, Coxon, just a question on um, just semantic web technologies in general and the idea of um, querying across um, ontologies. Is there a limitation as far as the, with your system, as far as I can see, or semantic web technologies, you're making statements about things, so you're saying that this protein is a whatever, or it has this binding site, it has this function, or a particular molecule is like a fatty acid or whatever. It's very this you know, discrete statements that you make about things and then you reason across that. Is there a limitation though that if you come across that there's no way of inferring knowledge from that insofar as that you can make, if you came across with an entirely novel um, protein or an entirely novel small molecule, you can't make any, you can't question about that because the system has never seen it before. Is that a limitation insofar as that you can't actually infer new knowledge from this, you can just Query, query of what is um, existing and what is known. That's true. You can only query what you have, but sometimes there are data already there. You can always see query, but you just don't realize that maybe that protein is a specific drug. You don't realize that. But once you query your database and find that that drug is similar to something else, you can perhaps infer that you have made a candidate for that. Yeah, but, but it's, that, that, it's it, that question of a similar thing. You know, you can't say that is similar to that, but I, that doesn't seem to be... It doesn't seem that you can capture that kind of... that mental leap that we can make <laughs> in such a system. In, well, in our ontology, we use, for example, <coughs> gene ontologies, which assigns molecular functions, but there might be other links that you can capture, maybe. Not that, I'm not saying we... we designed the ontology and we captured the whole domain of the post-synthetic biology. Yeah. 
I'm not saying that there are lots of things that we didn't capture. I just wonder if it could be augmented with more kind of cheminformatics approaches or more biochematic okay. approaches. Then you, you've got the knowledge that you know, and then you can make the leap that say this compound looks like that compound, of which I know these facts about. You know that it strikes me that on its own it'd be less useful than having this kind of hybrid system where that knows a little more about chemistry and biochemistry. Yes, certainly. You can always mine your raw data and then maybe as next day you can provide some more high-level information. This can be probably better represented using biological networks. Yeah. yeah. But raw data, you have sometimes you have to do bioinformatics to compare sequences or search for specific encodings and you have to do that. I guess it's not something that okay. biological networks are used to really. I can just add provide an additional answer to that. Um, so far, when we say ontologies, as you know, in the semantic web standards, there are multiple levels of what we call ontologies. There's a format called OWL, actually, this is the one you're using. And the first level of that language provides inferencing between terms when there are synonyms or stuff like that. The two subsequent levels, which are considered as being dangerous by the computer science guys, are actually doing a little more because whenever they provide some inferencing at two or three or four degrees, then they are directly retrofitting that, that link <clears throat> and creating a direct link, so they are like enriching the ontology at query time. And therefore, uh, there is like an extension of the Sparkle language. That's the first thing that we are monitoring right now in the company. And the second thing is machine learning and deep learning is also now trying to merge with that space so that query inferencing and let's say mining are trying to live together in one system. Yeah. But it's really so what you said last is what we're implying. And and this is for curation and measurement interesting, but this is a curation and quality process as well, of course. Back to <coughs> microbiome. <laughs> uh, did you test a, a relaxation or recovery capacity of the entity? I mean, if you cause artificially, say, a diarrhea, poor mouth, by the way, uh, with the physiological uh, some stuff, uh, then how fast uh, the biome gets into the normal condition, normal state? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think, uh, but. It's important to remember that really the microbiome field is extremely young. Uh, although the word has been used for, for a fairly long time, the real quantitative data date back from less than five years ago. Uh, so this is still extremely descriptive, where people take a bunch of samples that may be more or less biologically relevant, deep sequence them to find out what kind of bugs there are, and that's it. As far as I know, there is not a single actual follow-up experiment during an actual illness that has ever been done. It has? Which one then? I uh, can't both remember. Both in USA and former Soviet Union, there was quite abundant uh, data on spacemen uh, concerning the intestinal microflora uh, dynamics. And Quite a number of those data are freely published, are openly published, are not classified. And uh, uh, actually, yes, uh, those data says uh, that uh, for human being in quite specific conditions... Meaning some other are classified. Sure, sure. Uh, no, quite specific in physiological terms, first of all. Uh, uh, the recovery is quite fast. So, uh, Very interesting. Well, um, yes, I'm thinking as we are discussing. So what we see in the mouse indeed is that as soon as we stop, uh, so uh, theta is pretty stable, but it will get outcompeted uh, after about 30 days. Actually, my question addresses not the theta itself, but the composition or combined engine consisting of a mouse and a theta. So uh, if you in make some dilution of intestinal microflora, then how fast it recovers to the previous to normal status? 
Well, yeah, one of the reasons why I have difficulty to answer that question is that I am not sure how to define normal status ever. Uh, so we See, actually... It was my attempt to understand how you define it. <laughs> so in... Sorry, good answer. <laughs> I will just speak about what we have done. And in what we have done, we actually never look at the endogenous microflora. Uh, so far, what we follow exclusively is the engineered bug that we put in it. The only measure of the resident, uh, the resident microflora we have is the total count on a given type of blade, which is an extremely biased measure. Uh, and some qPCR data where we measure the total abundance of 16S of a specific type of 16S, which is theta. Uh, and in those experiments, we actually, so the problem is we start from streptomycin treated mouse. So when we start the experiment, we don't have a natural microflora. We have something which was heavily depleted. So we do have bacteria that survive streptomycin, many of them, uh, but that's nothing like a natural microflora. So what we know is that once we stop streptomycin, Within about two days, the guts are fully colonized with stuff. <laughs> but uh, we cannot define as of now what stuff is, and even less whether or not stuff after is the same as stuff before. Uh, but that's exclusively for what we do. Uh, and yes, I mean, the, the data is, is obtainable, uh, but that has not been a major focus for us until now. Yes, thank you. So, a question for Goxo. So if I can easily map the um, uh, S-ball uh, attempt to uh, the bottom-up mainstream uh, synthetic biology, I have more difficulties with some other approaches to synthetic biology, such, such as top-down or cells or whatever. And I'd like to know if, uh, if there are some uh, extensions of S-ball in the planning that would uh, be more adapted to uh, top-down top down, uh, genome reduction, whatever uh, approaches that are not of the bottom-up uh, mainstream type. Uh, my comment would be is SBO doesn't dictate whether you start with bottom-up or top-down. So it's about exchanging your information without losing any information. So you, you should be able to exchange your designs and in my lab, I should be able to replicate. So I think ESCO would still be useful for top-down designs. Um, if you mean specifying some abstract definitions, like specifications, ESCO can still be used, so you can substitute things, or you can create templates. But you can even represent the whole genome using ESCO. That's perfectly fine. Okay. And ESCO is RDF-based and backed up it turns from different ontologies and we also developed in a way that's really extensible. Even if you can't uh, represent your specific application specific data with ESPO, we have an ability <coughs> to store your data and during round trips it wouldn't be lost. So those kind of entities we call them generic top level and we treat them as external data and we then we introduced that concept, we basically wanted to easily create extensions in the future. At the moment, we don't have a context extension. Context information is not easily exchangeable for data sheet. But in the future, there will be extensions to ESPO. Hopefully, some group will develop and will be voted into the short track, and we will see less extent as well with this extension. No other questions? Still have some time. No other quick uh, question. So you use this approach of delivering Cas9 toward targeting e head using M13 rates, which well is a great idea, although M13 as you mentioned is probably not easy to transfer to use for other for other microbes that, that don't have the F. But this idea could be used for with other with all the other phages that you are developing, like 
delivering this uh, type of uh, toxins, let's say, nucleases into the into the with these bacteriophages. But um, in addition to the addition to the uh, targeting of, of the bacteria, you, have you considered also the replication requirement of the phage in the sense that, uh, I mean, um, in order to have, let's say, a minimum set of uh, phages that could co uh, infect many bacteria, it's not only the capacity to, let's say, infect at the, at the beginning, but also the ability to replicate inside. Um, I don't know if these are very strict for many phases. So do you think this could be a limitation? So, yes and no, as usual. So, um, that depends what kind of application of phages you envision. If you envision delivery of DNA, like the Cas9 system with M13, and you just want to package it into something else which is better than M13, then phage replication is not relevant at all. There is no phage replication. You package your uh, cargo DNA in the lab, then you deliver it, and then it's just a, a one a capsid, one bacterium heap type of system. Then the plasmid you design may or may not be replicative. That depends on what you want to do with your Cas9 system. But the phage replication does not occur, cannot occur. That's the whole idea behind phage. And maybe I'm not going to say too much about it because I'm guessing that this is what David Picard is going to be talking about tomorrow. Um, so, uh, in this case, this is a one capsid, one hit, and if you have a billion cells to kill, you need a billion phages and you need each one of them to find its target. And this is one of the reasons why I don't really like that approach, and I am still a big proponent of more classical phage therapy where you indeed use the capacity of the phage to spread once it found the right bacteria. In this case, there is indeed a lot more than just host recognition to do with replication. Um, so, uh, bacteria have developed a lot of phage resistance mechanisms outside of simply changing, evolving, mutating receptors. Uh, of very different types and of uh, a, a high diversity from strain to strain. And it then becomes a question of choosing the most appropriate scaffold. So the best one there is. But this is also the reason why at some point I mentioned that I don't believe we will make do with a single scaffold. We'll probably need a few. The idea is to limit as much as possible the number of scaffold we need to use because as Yvonne said yesterday, every time you introduce a new component in the system, there is one, an increased number of risk of failure, and second, there is an increased cost in getting it approved, tested, uh, guaranteed to be okay. Okay, so I propose to thank our speakers for their presentations.